Um, we're going to be going on an incredible journey uh, this evening. We're going to be going on a journey back in time, many thousands of years. And the idea of us going on this incredible journey back in time is to do uh, quite an astounding thing. It is to try to convince you and prove to you that the current conflict in Iraq, which has been uh, happening now for several years, is extremely significant that it is spoken about accurately in the Bible, almost as accurately as any news report. And more than all of those things, I'm hoping I can show you that the current conflict is in fact a sign of the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now those are big claims to make, and you might already be thinking, well, surely not. But I want you, if you would, to... um, to to, to take on board the things that we're going to be saying and looking at the passages that we're going to be turning to and come with me, uh, if you would, uh, back in time. So this is my uh, time machine here and um, so all of us have got to get on board here and and we're going to be uh, heading back in time. So we leave 2007 behind And we're hurtling back pretty quickly here. uh, And we're going all the way back to the uh, 2000 BC. 2000 BC. This is, of course, about 4,000 years ago. And we've just landed. And uh, this is what we can see in front of us. There's this huge tower uh, that has been built in front of us. And we've actually gone back to the time of Babel. And to understand some of the things that were happening in uh, Babel, uh, we can read about it almost at the beginning of our Bibles in Genesis chapter 10. And all the, 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 the verses are on the screen. If uh, in this dim light you can, uh, if you want to open your Bibles and follow it as well, then that's fine. But Genesis chapter 10, verse 10 tells us something quite unique and quite interesting. It tells us that at the, be- the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel in the land of Shinar. Now this actually is the first time in the Bible that the word kingdom is used. And it is because we believe that this is the first kingdom The first time that this word kingdom is used is here, 2,000 years before Jesus was born, 4,000 years ago. Now all kingdoms, you see, have got a couple of different things. Uh, I suppose a kingdom has got three key parts to it. It's got a king, there's a land, there's a capital city, and there's lots of rules and things for those people. And a kingdom is normally lots of different cities in a geographical area that have sort of come together uh, under the rulership of one person. And that is what Babel actually was. It was the first kingdom uh, upon this earth. Uh, And so from this little verse that I've put up there, we can already see uh, who it was that was ruling the place. It was a chap called Nimrod. Nimrod ruled Uh, Babel. It was in, we're told, if you see up there, in the land of Shinar. So that was the, the, if you like, the centre of this kingdom. And the capital city was Babel. If you read Genesis chapter 10, you'll see, in fact, that there were other cities involved, like Nineveh and so on, which he also built. But Babel was where this chap, Nimrod, had his capital. We read more about Babel in the next chapter, in Genesis chapter 11. And this is the people talking. By the way, I'm presuming that we're all on board with the fact that the verses in in all of the Bible are inspired by the Lord God. So when we're reading these things, this isn't a man making making this uh, event up. This is the living God in heaven telling us factually and actually what did happen all those years ago. 
So in Genesis chapter 11 verse 4, we read about the people who were living in Nimrod's kingdom saying to themselves, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one and they all have one language. There wasn't lots of different languages you see at this point on earth. And God said, this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them that they've imagined to do. Go to, let's go down, says God, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So Nimrod and all the people were building this incredible city and a tower. And this tower was gigantic absolutely a huge thing and the whole idea was to make a name for themselves this whole project was about saying actually we forget about God we human beings have the answers to all things let's make us a name forget about the name of God and what that means let us make us a name we're the important ones and by the way let's not worship God anymore we'll have our, a new religion and worship lots of different gods And this tower was the centre of false worship at that time. Babel, as I'm sure some of you know, means confusion. Babel, you see, wasn't just about confusing the language of the people, which God did. It was actually about the king Nimrod and his wife, who was called Semiramis, and others in the government of those days, confusing the masses, telling them a pack of lies about what life was about and who to worship. They said, worship me. That's what Nimrod said. In fact, you know, they called Nimrod Baal, which means my Lord. And they called his wife, Semiramis, Baalti, which means my lady. And they worshipped them. The people did. Nimrod's own name means rebellion. And this whole thing going on in this kingdom of people coming together was rebellion against God and that's why God did not put up with it and said that's the end I'm going, you, the people are confused right I'll confuse them and he confused their language the tower was all to do with false worship and the city that was built was all to do with man saying we're in authority we're in charge we know what to do and the Lord God bought it to an end when he confused the language of the people because they left off from building the city you'll read in Genesis chapter 11. So where was Babel? Well here is a a, a map. Um, I've already told you it's in the the land of Shinar and Babel is is up here and this uh, grid here in red is actually upon that map there, in that area there. It was smack in the middle of modern day Iraq. So the beginning of the kingdom of men was in modern day Iraq. Absolutely uh, categoric on that point. There was an exception though in this kingdom. There was one man actually who refused to bow down to Nimrod. There was a man who said, no, this is not right. And in fact, ancient Jewish writings say that this man actually went to Nimrod himself to persuade him to stop doing what he was doing and Nimrod refused to do it. And that one exception is mentioned in the same chapter of uh, Genesis chapter 11 and that man is none other than Abraham and that is why we read of Abraham in Genesis chapter 11 he lived at exactly the same time as Babel and in Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 so the next very next verse of the very next chapter the Lord God has a message to this man who refused to bow down to Nimrod the Lord said unto Abraham get thee out of thy country which was, we read in the previous chapter, Ur of the Chaldees, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, because apparently he made idols, unto a land that I will show you. 
and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So God says, I'm picking you now, Abraham, out of all these people that live in this land, out of all these people that are worshipping and building this giant tower. Because Abraham knew that this was in total defiance of the Lord God. And as I say, ancient Jewish writings, outside the Bible, so I can't speak 100% for their veracity, but ancient Jewish writings do tell us that Abraham refused to have anything to do with Nimrod, with the city or the tower. So where was Ur of the Chaldees? Where did Abraham actually live? Well, here's the map. And you can see Ur of the Chaldees actually on the same map. Not very far from uh, Babel. And again, down here in southern Iraq. That's where Abraham lived. And God says, get out. Get out and go somewhere else that I'm going to show you. Now, we're going to go back in time just for a minute, a little bit further. So we're leaving Babel behind just for a quick minute, and we're going racing back now in time even further. We're going back another 2,000 years, and we're going back to the time when God created the world. We're going back to 4,000 BC, to the time of Eden. Now, where was the Garden of Eden? Well, we know pretty much where the Garden of Eden was. And surprisingly, or perhaps not, it's actually on this same map. Because we're told specifically where Eden was. We're told that it was at the head of four rivers. We're told it was at the head of the Euphrates, the Hiddekel, the Gihon, and the Pison rivers. And upon this map here... There's the Euphrates, there's the Hiddekel, which had its name changed to the Tigris, there's the Gihon, and there's the Pison rivers. There is no doubt that Eden began in the very same place, in southern Iraq. Well, what happened in the Garden of Eden? Well, we know that it was here that sin and death entered into the world God said if you sin and disobey me death will come and they sinned as by one man sin entered into the world which was Adam and death by sin this became the home of sin and death I want you to keep that in your mind as we go back now to Abraham So we're back now 2,000 years before Jesus was born, 4,000 years ago. And here is Abraham. And you remember I told you that God said to him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from from thy father's house unto a land that I'm going to show you. So let's put Abraham uh, into Ur of the Chaldees down there. And this is the journey that Abraham went on. It took him a bit longer than this, okay? (laughs) So uh, he probably took him quite a while, but that's where he went. He didn't know where he was going, but God took him to a land called Canaan, which became known after his grandchild, uh, sorry, uh, Jacob, uh, whose name was changed to Israel. The actual land itself became known, and still is known even today, as Israel. (coughs) Now here's the thing. On this right hand side over here, first of all we have uh, Adam with the promise of death and sin entering into the world. Over here we have Abraham 
And suddenly the promise of life, because the Lord God said to Abraham, I am going to make of you a great nation, and in you all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. But get out of that area. More than that, we see here that there was the beginning of the kingdom of men in the very same place, this rebellion against God. And yet what do we see over here? But Israel and the beginning of the kingdom of God. Not sin and death and despair over here, but hope and forgiveness and of course the very place that the Lord Jesus Christ came from himself. (coughs) And here's the thing. All of us start off over here and all of us have the choice of getting out of this and getting as Abraham did over there and leaving behind sin and death and destruction and the kingdom of men and moving ourselves into a position where we can one day with Abraham live in the future kingdom of God that will be centred on Israel and so began a great conflict between these two areas that has flared up over time both physically and spiritually, between Babel and between Israel. They're totally anti each other. One is following God and trying to follow him, and the other is rebellion and sin and death. Now then, we're back in the time machine. I'm, I hope you're not getting exhausted by doing this, but uh, we're now back in this time machine. So where do we go now? I've already told you that Babel came to an end. That God confused their language and Babel finished being a a, a great uh, city and a tower. The tower was destroyed, legend has it, by a great fire that destroyed the top half of it and a great wind uh, destroyed another third of it. But there was the base of it still remained. And we're now uh, going uh, towards where we live now in time so we're leaving 2000 BC and we're heading uh, to 600 BC so this is 600 years now before Jesus was born and we come to the time of Babylon and we get out of our time machine and what do we see well we see before us one of the seven wonders of the ancient world because the hanging gardens of Babylon, as you, I'm sure you're all aware, were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so here we are in 600 BC, and here is the Babylonian Empire, centred there in Babylon. The Babylonian Empire ran from roughly 600 BC to about 640 BC, something like that. And it was an incredible city, an absolutely astounding city. They had horse races six abreast on the walls of this city. It was a gigantic city uh, with great splendour. It was ruled over by a number of kings, but the one that we're interested in is this king, King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar... Uh, conquered, as you saw, that huge area, uh, including Israel, as we'll quickly see. We read, all that, we read about Nebuchadnezzar in many different places, and actually, a hundred years ago, people actually doubted that Nebuchadnezzar even uh, existed. You can go to the British Museum now and see bricks with his name in the side, because they've uncovered so many uh, things. He is a factual person that lived uh, as a king of Babylon. And there we are in 1 Kings 24, one verse just telling us a little bit about Nebuchadnezzar and what did he do? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem. So he headed right over to that other side and besieged the city. But you might say, well, why are we here? You've left Babel, we've gone to Babylon, what's the link? There's a lot of links. I'll put it to you that Babylon was in fact resurrected Babel. (coughs) 
In fact, when you get home, have a look in Genesis chapter 10 again, and when you read Babel, you'll see in your Bible there's a little mark next to the word Babel, and in your margin it will say Babylon. That is because Babel and Babylon are exactly the same. They are spelt the same in Hebrew, in fact. It was situated in exactly the same place, in the plain of Shinar. Nebuchadnezzar rebuilt the tower on the same base, legend has it, upon the very same base that remained all those years. He rebuilt a great ziggurat, as they called it, a gigantic tower. Babylon itself was an immense city. So once again we have a city and a tower. I've already told you that Babylon is the same as Babel in Hebrew became the centre of false worship once again. They worshipped uh, the same false gods that they worshipped all those years ago in Babel. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had a dream. And we're going to just think a little bit now about a particular dream that he had. And I just need to tell you about who interprets this dream, because as you've already seen from the screen... um, Nebuchadnezzar sent his troops in and attacked Israel and in fact he destroyed the temple that was built there and he grabbed a load of people that he liked the look of and brought them back into Babylon which of course is modern day Iraq anyway he brings some of them back in and one of the chaps there that he brought back in rose up in the ranks and his name was Daniel you can read all about this surprisingly in the book of Daniel and you'll read about Daniel and the fact that he uh, and and how he got promoted uh, within the ranks of Nebuchadnezzar's court but what I'm going to play you now is uh, is a clip if you like that have put together of how I imagine a particular vision that Nebuchadnezzar had and you'll see why we're going to look at this in just a minute so here is a dream that Nebuchadnezzar the king had given to him by God. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the beasts of the field found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked, and there before me was a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, Cut down the tree, and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it, and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let him be given the mind of an animal, till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict, so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes, and sets over them the lowliest of men. Right, now it's quite a strange uh, vision, isn't it, that Nebuchadnezzar had? And he didn't know what it meant. And in Daniel chapter 4, he calls in Daniel. And this was the vision that he had of a great tree, massive great tree, and this tree gets lopped down. And there was just a stump that remained. And then we read that there were bands of iron and brass that went round this stump. Stop it growing again, I presume. And it talked as well, if you, if you were listening to that, about um, somebody becoming like a, a beast. So when the tree got chopped down, somebody became like a beast, it said. And, and, it, and his hair was going to grow and his fingers were going to grow with like birds' claws. Until seven times passed by. <coughs> Seven times were going to pass by. And after the seven times, this person was going to get the kingdom back again. Now that's a very uh, strange vision. 
and Nebuchadnezzar didn't have a clue as to what it meant until Daniel came in and interpreted this vision for him. And in Daniel chapter 4, verse 22, Daniel says to the king, he says, It is thou, O king, that has, become, that has grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reached unto heaven, and thy dominion unto the end of the earth. And so I, what I put it to you is this, is that this vision was about two things. It was about thou, O king, and thy dominion. In other words, your empire. It's about you and the kingdom of Babylon. And then Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, you're going to um, be removed from this kingship ruling over Babylon. In fact, you're going to become like a beast yourself. Your hair's going to grow and your fingernails are going to grow like bird's claws. And you'll be driven from men. You'll be certainly driven from power. And seven times will go by. And after that seven times, O King Nebuchadnezzar, you will get your kingdom back again. That's what Daniel said. But it also applies in a much bigger picture to the kingdom of Babylon itself because it applied to Nebuchadnezzar's dominion, his empire. So in other words, Babylon was going to end one day but after seven times went by it would be reinstated and appear again on the earth. So let me just uh, make this a bit clearer if I can. There's the tree it gets chopped down. Seven times go by and there's the stump which can never become a great tree again because it's restrained by bands of brass and iron. And being restrained like that meant it could never completely grow again but the stump still existed. Daniel says, that's a little bit like you Nebuchadnezzar as this great tree. You're going to be chopped down in effect. You're going to become like a beast for seven times and after that you'll get your kingdom again. Also, I'm saying to you that it applies to his dominion, so the same applies to, in a similar way, to the actual kingdom of Babylon, that Babylon itself would come to an end, came to an end at a different time to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, actually. Seven times were going to go by, and then just as Nebuchadnezzar got his kingdom back again, so Babylon would reappear on the earth. Not as a great tree, but as a stump. Still the same sort of thing, but not a great, grand, incredible tree. Now then, how long is seven times? How long was Nebuchadnezzar himself like a beast? Well, one time, we find this out from a number of different places, one time is a Jewish year. And a Jewish year is 360 days. They added an extra month every now and again to make up the, the lost five and a quarter days. So, but one Jewish year is 360 days. So seven times is seven lots of 360 days. So Nebuchadnezzar became like a beast for 2,520 days. That's how long he was like a beast for. But that's what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. He was acting out, if you like, a little tiny picture of something far greater that was going to happen. And that was when Babylon itself came to an end, which was quite a number of years later. Well, hold on a minute. Babylon came to an end a very, very long time ago. So were you saying to me that Babylon was just going to be uh, f away from the earth for 2,520 days? No. Because we find quite often, often in the scriptures that one day can equal one year in prophecy. In uh, Numbers chapter 14, for instance, we're told that a day in that instance equals a year. And if you do that... 
instead of 2,520 days, you get 2,520 years. And in fact, if you go and when you get when you get home and have a look in Daniel chapter five, the very next chapter from this astounding vision. It's a chapter that's out of sync with the rest of Daniel because it leaps forward to the very last day of Babylon when uh, another king that came after Nebuchadnezzar called Belshazzar was having a great wild orgy of a party and while that was all going on a hand appeared writing on the wall and the writing on the wall is still a phrase that we use today and the writing said, your time is up for Babylon, it's going to finish. And that very night, Babylon came to an end. Now, nobody knows exactly the year that Babylon came to an end. Uh, Brother John Thomas uh, originally said it was 542 BC. Since then, that date has got jiggled around a bit, but that well, everybody thinks it's within a five year period of time, somewhere between 536 BC to 542 BC. So there's not a huge difference of opinion, but there's a little window there of about five years where Babylon, uh, people believe, came to an end. So what I'm saying to you is that just like Nebuchadnezzar lost his kingdom, became like a beast, and for seven times uh, lost the kingdom but then regained it again, so that happens here. 2,520 years after the fall of Babylon brings you to the late 70s, 1970s that is, early 1980s. So here is Babylon coming to an end and here we are suggesting that Babylon in some way reappears again on the earth. But remember... It's not as the great tree that it once was. It's as a, a stump that is restrained by uh, bands of iron and brass that we're not actually going to have time to consider this evening. I'm hoping this makes sense to you because what happened to Nebuchadnezzar was actually being played out as a far greater thing as often happens, doesn't it, in, um, in the scriptures. Something happens, it's acted out here, and yet there's a far greater symbology or far greater meaning over a far greater period of time. But isn't it amazing that that 2,520 years brings us to 1978 and 1982? So what? Did anything happen then? Well, it did. It categorically did. Babylon began to be revived in a literal sense at that exact time. 2,520 years after the fall of Babylon, a man came to power calling himself publicly, and I'll show you some of these things now, uh, a latter-day Nebuchadnezzar. He ruled the area of ancient Babylon. He tried to rebuild and did actually rebuild the ancient city of Babylon. He tried to rebuild the Babylonian Empire by attacking surrounding nations with the sole aim of um, uh, bringing the Babylonian Empire back into existence, but he was restrained from doing so. And he was this man here, Saddam Hussein, who we now know is dead. So you might say, well, hold on a minute, this is... Uh, this is this is old news, surely. Well, let me uh, bring you up to speed with what the Bible says about this. First of all, this man ruled Iraq, which is that area here. There is where the Garden of Eden was. There is Ur of the Chaldees. There is Babylon. And that's where he ruled from, about uh, 15 miles north of Babylon, uh, in Baghdad but he ruled the exact same area uh, as initially it was in and there is a 50 dinar note uh, from the central bank of Iraq with the Tower of Babel uh, there upon it
Anyway, he comes to power in 1978. And in one of his opening speeches, he compared himself to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, look, what's most important to me about Nebuchadnezzar is the link between the Arabs' abilities and the liberation of Palestine, Israel. Nebuchadnezzar was, after all, an Arab from Iraq, albeit ancient Iraq. Nebuchadnezzar was the one who brought the bound Jewish slaves, like Daniel, uh, from Palestine. That's why whenever I remember Nebuchadnezzar, I like to remind the Arabs, Iraqis in particular, of their historical responsibilities. It's a burden that should not stop them from action, but rather spur them into action because of their history. Then, you might have said, well, that's his opening speech, but, and maybe it means nothing. But then what does he do? Uh, he then uh, starts a Babylon festival and produces these particular coins here, with him and the ancient Nebuchadnezzar on the same coin to say, hold on a minute, that was him back then, this is me now. Then he began the reconstruction of Babylon in the early 1980s and this is uh, the throne room. You can see some people, tiny, tiny dots down here. 60 million bricks went into this project and it was a gigantic place, because Babylon originally was a big old place. It didn't look incredibly impressive, like the original Babylon, but he did rebuild it. He used, um, because they were still there, some of the original bricks from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, and in the bricks is written, I am Nebuchadnezzar, king of the world. That is actually imprinted into the original bricks that, uh, that he used, but he added 60 million of his own bricks, and on those bricks he wrote, on every one, in the era of President Saddam Hussein, all Babylon was constructed in three stages, from Nebuchadnezzar to Saddam Hussein, Babylon is rising again. I mean, there's the hanging gardens of Babylon, and he tried to copy that in a very uh, poor way. He built a gigantic palace uh, right where the original palace uh, was. But it was, again, there's the tree, the, one of the seven wonders of the world. This is a stump. This is nothing in comparison, but that's what God said would happen. In fact, in this palace, when the soldiers and the army went in, because they used this particular palace as a base... Uh, on the ceiling and walls of the Saddam Palace was a 360-degree 300, mural depicting scenes from ancient Babylon, Ur, and the Tower of Babel. So he actually painted these scenes within the palace itself. If you'd bought a paper on April the 30th, 1989, uh, called the New York Times, you would have read this headline... Nebuchadnezzar's revenge, Iraq flexes its muscles by rebuilding Babylon. So this is now in the New York Times, uh, 1989. When King Nebuchadnezzar ran things around here some two and a half thousand years ago, he left clear instructions for the future kings of Babylon that are finally being carried out. Writing in cuneiform script on tablets of clay, the royal scribes urged their master successors to repair and rebuild his temples and palaces. Today, in a gesture rich in political significance, President Saddam Hussein, Iraq's strong-armed ruler, is sparing no effort to obey that now distant command. Two and a half thousand years later... God says 2,520 years later, it will start appearing again on the earth. The other thing that Nebuchadnezzar did was built, uh, we read about this at the beginning of Daniel chapter 3, I think, or Daniel chapter 4, I think it's Daniel chapter 3. Um, we read about Nebuchadnezzar building a giant statue of himself, uh, we presume it was of himself in gold, 90 feet tall. I mean, just to give you some idea of the scale of that, there's some little people down the bottom. This was one heck of a big statue, made of gold. Saddam Hussein, again, copying what uh, the original Nebuchadnezzar did, but very poorly, 
built statues of himself and that's the biggest one that got torn down by the Americans in central Baghdad Uh, but as you can see there's the stump there's the real thing if you like The other thing was, of course, that the original Nebuchadnezzar launched an attack upon uh, Israel. In fact, it was an incredibly successful attack because he became the first person to utterly destroy the nation of Israel by actually wiping out uh, the temple and Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, sorry, Saddam Hussein had a similar idea. Saddam Hussein declared Palestine has been stolen on the 18th of June 1990 and exhorted the Arab world to recover the usurped rights in Palestine and free Jerusalem from Zionist captivity. Then, I'm sure most of you remember this, in February 1991 we had the Gulf War when Saddam Hussein launched 39 Scud missiles at Israel Um, So here now we've got these two areas. We've got Babylon and we've got Israel versing each other. Um, He destroyed 3,300 apartments and buildings in Tel Aviv especially with these Scud missiles. But incredibly, not one single solitary person lost their life apart from one man who died on the way to the hospital of a heart attack. Not a single person died during those missiles raining down upon Israel. So you see, once again, he tries to come. And there he is on a huge painting uh, of himself as Nebuchadnezzar fighting modern-day American forces. Now then, so what? He's dead. Well, how does all this fit in? Well, in Isaiah chapter 14, we read about this particular amazing passage that says that this is the Lord God talking about taking up a proverb against the king of Babylon. Now, bearing in mind, it doesn't ever mention his name here. It doesn't say Nebuchadnezzar. It just calls him the king of Babylon. And he says in verse 12, this whole chapter is about the king of Babylon... How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Lucifer was a name that Nebuchadnezzar gave himself. You're cut down to the ground, you did weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you will be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit, Now look at this next verse here. They that see thee will narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms? When they see you in this pit, says God, the nations are going to say, Was this really what we were frightened about? Is this really this king of Babylon, the man that we were so scared about? And that is exactly what the press said when this man was found in a pit and all of the press at the time was saying and George Bush himself stood up in the White House and said is this really the man that we were scared of and frightened of as he uh, paraded the gun that they had captured from Saddam Hussein when he was found in that pit because he said himself I am a king of Babylon and he was a king of Babylon he was a ruler of that area and began the rebuilding of it. And so, if you look at that, there's Nebuchadnezzar, and what happened to him, and there's Saddam Hussein, and what happened to him. And the two things are quite uncannily similar. So all the way through his life, things are starting to um, be mirrored with the original Nebuchadnezzar. But what about his death? Well, Isaiah 14 tells you about his death. In verse 18, it says that all the kings of the nations lie in state. You know, if you're a king and you die, if the queen died tomorrow, what a wonderful, amazing funeral there would be, wouldn't there? 
All the kings of the nations lie in state, each in his own tomb, but you're not going to have that privilege, says God. You're cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch. If you look here, it says that um, you will not join uh, the kings in burial. For you, you notice here, have destroyed your land and killed your people. That's precisely the charge that was given to Saddam Hussein in his trial, that he had destroyed the land by blowing up all the oil fields and killing his own people. We're even told, so he, di- he, he, didn't ev- he never did, of course, uh, have a state funeral. He was hung, as we know. In fact, it even tells us what happens to his sons. God says, prepare a place of slaughter for his sons so that nobody could ever take over again. And as we know, the two sons of Saddam uh, also came to their end uh, in the war. So you see, all this is accurately told to us before it actually happened. But you might say, well, what happens now? What does, what's the next bit in the chapter? And I'm going to show you the next bit in the chapter, and it goes like this. Because the next verse says, I will cut off from Babylon, says God, her name, and her survivors, her offspring and her descendants, declares the Lord. I will turn her into a place for owls and into a swampland. I will sweep her with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord Almighty. And that is what is coming. There is great destruction, more than we have seen even yet. Uh, in this land of sin and death and the kingdom of men where it began. But what about this current war in Iraq? Does the Bible say anything about that? Because surely, as as Time magazine says, it is a mission not accomplished. It was still headline news this uh, this afternoon as I drove up here um, with all the more bombings and suicide killings that have happened. Well, amazingly, it is. It's in the, ne- in the previous chapter. It's in Isaiah that we read together in chapter 13. Because we read there of the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah saw. And originally, this all applied to original Babylon. But it applies, I'm putting to you, to modern day Babylon, uh, the literal land. Uh, because we read of a noise of a multitude in the mountains, like of as a great people. The noise of the kingdoms of the nations being gathered together. They come from a far country, these nations, and they come to destroy the whole land. Howl ye when you see these things happening, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. They will be be afraid, and pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth, travaileth. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, both cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy the sinners out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations will not give their light, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible, and I will shake says God, the heavens, and the earth will remove out of her place because of the Lord and his fierce anger. And those things never happened in that way with the original Babylon. So if we look at this in a tiny bit of detail, there's Babylon, and there is the empire of modern-day Babylon. And it has been a place where the nations have been gathered together The 2003 invasion of Iraq began on March the 19th and many, many nations joined forces coming from far countries to attack uh, this land and what they have done, as God said, is brought destruction the like of which this world probably hasn't seen in a, a very long time. I mean, how often do we hear of a suicide bombing killing hundreds of people almost daily uh, in this country it is great destruction 
And just to cover these things in a bit of detail, the day of the Lord is mentioned 29 times in the scriptures and every single solitary time it's talking about the time when the Lord God will intervene in the affairs of this world. A woman that travaileth, we know uh, again from John 16 and we know there's lots of references in the scriptures to the earth being like a woman in travail at the time of the end. We read about the stars of heaven uh, not giving their light and the sun being darkened and the moon uh, being darkened. And the Lord Jesus himself quotes that directly in Matthew chapter 24, saying exactly the same thing and saying then we'll see him returning. The punishment of the world for their evil is spoken about in Acts chapter 17. That has not happened. It is going to happen. And finally, the earth being shaken to and fro uh, certainly did not happen, as far as we know in the days of Babylon originally, but it will most certainly happen, and it's fast approaching, uh, because Ezekiel 38 tells us that the whole earth is going to shake so violently that every wall will fall to the ground. Um, I hope you're bearing with me here. This, this talk goes on a little, tiny bit longer but you invited me here, you know you're in for like a bit of a... <laughs> so it's just tough. But um, I'm going to finish this. Um, the next verse says this. So after all that about Babylon, nations being gathered, great destruction, and then the ju judgment of the world, we then come to verse 17, it almost goes back a little bit, and God says that he will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver or gold, they won't delight in those things. So at the very same time this is all happening, the Medes get stirred up. Who are the Medes then? Well, we read about the Medes in uh, most encyclopedias. The Medes were an Iranian people who lived in western and northwestern present-day Iran. So when you see Babylon with great destruction, at that time I'm going to raise up the spirit of the Medes the Persians, the Iranians. These are some slides, just quickly, from the weekly World Watch that I produce that were slides taken from just last year uh, showing how, in fact, Iran has been stirred up. It's, it's held and continues to hold incredibly huge military exercises, the like of which they have never... Uh, put on show uh, before. That was January the 26th last year. You see I was already uh, showing how the Medes uh, linked back up to this headline here from Isaiah chapter 13. Tehran threatens uh, to inflict harm and pain on America over the nuclear row. Uh, look at this. It, they are stirring up, said this particular headline in the Daily Telegraph, trouble in Iraq. God says, I will stir up the Medes at this time. Iran fires top secret missile. Um, and they've done a lot of that recently. That was in April last year. This is April the 25th. Israel raises Iran alert level because they're frightened about uh, Iran being stirred up. Ahmadinejad, August last year, said the actual Middle East solution is to destroy Israel and, um, and, and their overall backing for the Lebanon situation that we saw uh, they were most certainly behind that Lebanon war uh, last year. Iran wields influence in Iraq. It's established itself as America's chief rival, uh, said the Associated Press on August the 22nd last year. Iran fires missiles lots of them this time, all now capable of hitting Israel. That was November the 3rd last year. Iran fans the flames of hatred with a 
Holocaust conference that was December the 13th last year um, unfortunately we can even see some rabbis uh, or Jewish people attended that uh, supporting it believe it or not but uh, there we go and this is today uh, just before I left I looked on BBC online and there it was look here's Sunday the 11th at uh, two, 7 minutes past 2 US accuses Iran over Iraq bombs breaking news uh, America this afternoon has published a dossier like it did on Iraq saying that in fact Iran uh, is guilty and a great, this is a picture live from this afternoon when a great parade uh, went right through Iran this afternoon uh, with people uh, chant it, shouting death to America uh, because they, the president's called them out on the streets no doubt he got wind of this coming out as, as well that's today the Medes are being stirred up at exactly this time So then what? Well, the next bit is in Isaiah 13, verse 19, that Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. This hasn't yet happened. Never has Babylon been destroyed like God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, because that is what it looked like when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And that I put it to you, is still to happen. The great sweeping with destruction that Isaiah 14 speaks about after the death of the king of Babylon is still to come and is fast, fast approaching. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities, and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. You see, this is the fact that Babylon has been restored to be destroyed. Might sound daft, but this is exactly what the Bible says. I'm going to restore it and publicly destroy it in all aspects. Now, so far, all we've done is looked at Babylon, the literal place in Iraq. But it isn't just the literal place, because I know some of you will be thinking, well, hold on, it's more than that. So I've just got three slides left, which will take me five minutes to do. But I need to complete the picture briefly, so you don't think I'm going off on one, just talking about literal Iraq. Literal Iraq is as much a part of it as these other bits that we have focused on as a community for a long time. If you remember originally, Babel was a city and it was a tower. The city bit was the political government that Nimrod set up. We're putting man in authority, not God. The tower bit was the false religion. And there they worshipped Semiramis, who they called Baalti, which means my lady. They worshipped her, because when Nimrod died and she later had a son, they worshipped her, Nimrod's wife, and her baby child, and they called the baby child, they said this was Nimrod reincarnated, and that's who they worshipped. When we come um, to look at the political side of Babylon and the religious side of Babylon, which are mentioned in Revelation, chapter 17 and 18 specifically, we find out who they are. The political side of Babylon, uh, well, they, this is easy, because the political side of Babylon, the, pol the political side tell us that they're modelling what they're doing on Babylon. It is, in fact, Europe, 
and there is a poster from Europe uh, an official government uh, poster that, that came out of Europe saying Europe many tongues one voice and there is the uh, famous painting if you like or redrawn as um, on this poster of Babel Tower and they're saying that this whole European project is about bringing all these disparate nations who speak different languages back together again forget about God saying we should live, live separately let's all get back together again and in fact if you don't believe it that actually is their new parliament building uh, in Strasbourg in France and you can see it is modelled on um, the exact tower that was the original painting of Babel. And if you don't believe that, then when asked by a secular journalist why uh, this building was modelled on the Tower of Babel, an EU official applied what they failed to complete 3,000 years ago, we in Europe will finish now. And in fact, there is even a tower to this building internally with a uh, 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 with, with, a, with a picture within it of the Madonna and Child, which you'll see is significant uh, in a moment as well. So that's the political side, and in fact, it came into being as a true political body at exactly the same time, in 1978. But this is, that's another evening of chat. Revelation chapter 17 tells us about the religious part of Babylon. It tells us about a woman who is sat upon a beast and upon her head is Babylon written. And who is this woman? Uh, well, the woman is in fact uh, sat upon seven mountains and a woman in the Bible is, is often to, uh, associated with religion. But this isn't a nice religion, it's a prostitute uh, religion. Uh, it's a clear reference to Rome because Rome is the only religion on the planet that is based upon seven mountains and if you don't believe that then look up yourself in a Catholic encyclopedia and it tells you that it's within the city of Rome called the seven hills or the seven mountains that the entire area of the Vatican is now confined. The papacy is also this false religious system and the false worship kicked off big time again in 1978, another subject. But there is the original uh, worship of Semiramis and her god incarnate son Nimrod and who is it uh, that this false religion worships? It's none other than exactly the same false uh, god of uh, the Madonna and Child. In fact, you know, um, she is known as the Madonna. Madonna means my lady, and my lady is exactly the same as Baalti, which they called Semiramis. And so, finally, all aspects of Babylon have to be revived and publicly destroyed when the kingdom of God is established to replace Babylon in all aspects. So I'm putting to you that there is a literal, a spiritual and a political side to Babylon. We've looked at mainly the uh, literal side and the death of Saddam Hussein himself is the firing gun to all the other parts uh, coming to an end because the literal side will be utterly destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. But so will the spiritual side after that and so will the political side after that and what is going to replace all of this what is going to replace the kingdom of men and their godless wicked worthless ways before God it is this it is the literal and spiritual and political because it will be ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ as king kingdom of God that's what's going to be uh, replacing the current Babylonian system that is in this world right now. Just last slide, Jesus says, what shall I liken the kingdom of God to? What shall I say the kingdom of God is going to be like? Well, I'll tell you, he says, what it's going to be like. It's going to be like a tree. It's going to be like a tree and all the birds of the air will be able to dwell in this great tree. And this, uh, dear friends, is exactly the case. 
because the great tree of Babylon, including its stump, will be utterly, totally removed and re- be replaced with this great and wonderful tree uh, of the kingdom of God. And Daniel tells us that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And the kingdom won't be left to other people, uh, but it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms of the earth, and it shall stand forever. And just finally, I'd make this sincere, sincere plea right now. I am absolutely convinced that we are very, very, very close now uh, to Babylon in all its forms coming to an end and therefore very close to Jesus coming back. And therefore I would say this, that if at the moment you are still in the kingdom of men, in other words, if you have not moved like Abraham did out of Babylon out of the kingdom of men and got yourself over like he did into the coming kingdom of God and the only way of doing that now is through baptism I would urge you sincerely to think about it and don't say that you were were not warned because the time is ticking extremely fast right now and there is not a lot of time left so I'd urge you seriously to consider these things because surely we have proved and can prove that the Lord God is the God in heaven and he controls the affairs in this world and he sets up over the kingdoms of the world the basest of men. Thank you for listening.